Coronavirus Conversations. Welcome to a new segment called What to Watch. Today I'll be telling you a movie to watch and a couple YouTubers. First up, a great movie for the family is Toy Story 4. It came out last year and I think it's the greatest Pixar movie since the original Cars. The movie is about Woody and the crew getting used to their new owner, Bonnie, and now they have to take care of a toy she made called Forky. You can see what happens next on Disney Plus and some other social platforms. Next up, if you're if you know a youngling who loves Minecraft or any other game, then you might want to check out Stampy Longhead. He's a gaming YouTuber who plays Terraria, Minecraft, Overwatch, and a variety of other games. He's good for kids younger than 10. And then for kids like me, uh, there's a YouTuber named Steve Terryberry. He's basically if Jim Carrey was a guitarist. A very energetic and weirdly awesome guitarist who does many things like fixing horrible songs, busting subliminal subliminal messages, and makes fun of metal, and much more. He's good for kids 13 and up. So there you go. A brand new segment with more things to do during this time in our houses. I'll see you guys next week. Now off to my dad, who's going to tell you more things about other stuff. Hello everyone, welcome to a new segment called uh, Fitness Time. Today uh, we're going to do some yoga with, uh, with uh, our, our master here. Uh, so why don't you come- Alright, get in set position! Yes, arms out! Uh, okay. Today I am going to take you through some fitness. My name is Master Hu Flung Dung. Master Hu Flung Dung, oh, excuse me. Master Hu Flung Dung will, oh, excuse me. Master Hu Flung Dung will take you through fitness. Today we're going to do yoga. And this is my instructor, your hands out. Mm-hmm. All right, to loosen up, we want to uh, bring our noses to our feet and keep our back and knees still. Ready? And go, three, two, one, three, two, one. Bring your nose to your knees. Who did it? Yes, who did it? Oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And back up. Okay, do you feel stretched? No. I I feel stretched. Don't talk back to the master. (laughs) Okay? All right, now we are going to do Master Hu Fang Dung's, oh, excuse me, um, with, we are going to do some yoga poses, all right? This takes extreme strength, okay? So the first one I want to see all of you doing okay, is called the smell of your pits. The smell of your pits. So this one, you want to get in a wide stance like this, and you want to stretch this way until your pit comes to your nose, and sniff, oh, excuse me, and sniff, and sniff, and back up, and back up. Wave, wave, everybody. Wave to the Titanic, wave, yes. Yes. Who flung the... Excuse me. Was that good? Keep changing voices. Um, All right, here we go. Don't talk back. This one, you guys, I want you to face this way. Are you facing this way? All right. Here it is. This one is called... Are you facing this way? You're facing the master. (laughs) All right, turn around. All right. All right. This time... I want you to take your your hands to your toes, hands to your toes, and then walk it out, walk it out, walk it out, walk it out. Now lift your head, lift your head, Mm -hmm. and sing cock-a-doodle-doo. Cock-a-doodle-doo! Go ahead, cock-a-doodle-doo. Cock-a-doodle-doo. Cock-a-doodle-doo! And back, and back. 
<sighs> Are you feeling better? Are you feeling relieved? Is the coronavirus just leaving your system? <clears throat> I think so. I think so. Uh, all right, don't talk back to the master. Right, right, Hands right. out. Set position. And the last one. This one's called the murder victim. The murder victim. I'm gonna have my assistant right here lay down, right here, on your butt. Get on your butt. Lay down. Okay. Put your hands out. And give me one leg like this. Yes. Now close your eyes. Relax. <laughs> Relax. Can you see? This is called the murder victim. The, everyone can do it. Everyone. Everyone. And back up, rise. This is called the resurrection. It's Easter, it's coming. And we're back up, yes. Well, thank you guys for participating. And who flung the, oh, excuse me. <laughs> who flung Dung's fitness class? Do you feel better? Thank you. And put your hands together. And namaste. This is a One Church NWI breaking news alert. Chaos is reigning all across the country, all across Northwest Indiana, as kids are made to stay home and, wait for it, do homework at home. Oh my gosh, pictures are coming in right now. Look at this kid named Jonathan furiously seeking out food. No, he's not seeking out food. He's looking for lost books and homework. Instead, he found this. A pretty girl named Jada staring at her computer, wishing for, and I quote this just coming in, not to do homework. And I quote, to do anything but homework. Oh my gosh, in further news, breaking in Northwest Indiana, we found this kid was super angry when she found it was not true that homeschoolers don't make quill pens and she had to continue doing her real homework. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, in this emergency alert, there was one kid who asked if she liked e-learning and I quote, she said, no. And then she kicked the cat. In. A cat named Obi is okay. Ladies and gentlemen, chaos is reaching everywhere. Kids are actually made to do their homework. Oh my gosh, they might learn. My gosh. Tune in next week. And if you want your kids' pictures to be on this show, send them to me through Facebook Messenger during the week. I am John Pappas, and this has been a Breaking News Alert. Kids, are you paying attention out there? Are you sitting still for your family? Are you listening to mom and dad? Well, now's the time to prove yourself that you're listening. Tonight, we have story time. And we have the real video just for you. So pay attention, grab your books, because this week the story is the son of laughter. And as a special treat, we even have the video for you. So if you're ready, here we go. Three two, one, and away we go. Son of Laughter Years passed, and things didn't get any better. 
People were still just as cruel and mean to one another. They still got sick and died. God's world was still full of tears. It was never meant to be like this. But God was getting ready to do something about it. He was going to make all the wrong things right, and he was going to do it through a family. Abraham, God said, how many stars are there? God was about to tell his friend a wonderful secret. Uh, let me see, um, Abraham said, rolling up his sleeves. But have you ever tried counting stars? <laughs> then you know how hard it is. Uh, 993, 994, 997... Uh, 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 oh, no, wait. Uh, uh, one, two... Three. Well, of course, he kept losing count. Too many, he said. Guess what? God laughed. I will give you so many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you won't be able to count them either. Abraham couldn't help giggling at such a wonderful idea, but he stopped himself. How could he have a family? Don't be silly. He didn't have any children, let alone grandchildren. He wiped away a tear. Anyway, it was far too late for him to start having babies at his age. He was 99 years old. What could God mean? Abraham, God said, believe me. And then God told Abraham his secret rescue plan. Abraham, I will make your family very big, God promised, until one day your family will come to number more than even all the stars in the sky. Abraham looked up at the dark night sky, thick with stars. You will be my special family, my people, and through you everyone on earth will be blessed. It was an incredible promise. God was going to rescue the world through Abraham's family. One of his great, great, great grandchildren would be the child, the promised one, the rescuer. Oh, but it's too wonderful, Abraham said. How can it be true? Is anything too good to be true? God asked. Is anything too wonderful for me? So Abraham trusted what God said, more than what his eyes could see, and he believed. Now when Abraham's wife Sarah heard God's promise, she just laughed to herself. But it wasn't a happy laugh. It had tears in it. She had always wanted a baby. Could her dream come true? Could she really have a baby when she was 90 years old? No, of course not. Don't be silly. It was far too late. Sarah didn't believe God could do what he promised. She had forgotten that when God says something, it's as good as done. Of course it was as easy for God to give her a baby son as it was for him to make all the stars in the sky. And sure enough, nine months later, just as God had promised, Sarah gave birth to a baby boy. They named him Isaac which means son of laughter. And Sarah laughed. But this time it was a glorious, happy laugh. Her dream had come true. God would do as he promised. He would always look after Abraham's family, his special people. And one day, God would send another baby. A baby promised to a girl who didn't even have a husband. But this baby would bring laughter to the whole world. This baby would be everyone's dream come true. Did you pay attention? I think you guys did. Were you guys good? I think you were. Hey, wasn't that a great story? Here's what you can do. Tonight, after this show, go out and look out the window and look at all the stars. And every time you see a star, you can know this that God keeps his promises and he's looking over his children and that means you and that means me. I love you guys. Wasn't that a great story? I think it was. Well, I think we got some more stuff to show. So away we go.
Well, what's up, everyone? I hope you've enjoyed the Under the Roof show so far. Hey, I have a quick word for you, and I think it's going to be really good. It's about David and Goliath. And if you don't know the story, I'm going to go through the story, and then I'm going to give you a couple points that I think would really be encouraging during this, during this time. So around 3,000 years ago, there were two groups of people that were in constant war all the time. It was the Philistine group. The second group was the Israelites. And many people don't know this, but the Philistines were really a coastal people. And they were always trying to make their way into higher land and better land, especially uh, towards Israel. So they were constantly challenging Israel and challenging the kingdom and challenging this new king called Saul. Well, the Philistines decided to go to war with Israel to get better and higher ground. But King Saul, the first king of Israel, he saw that uh, they were coming and headed off their surprise attack. And so the two groups met around this valley called the Valley of Elam, and they became deadlocked. The northern part of the valley where the mountains were, that's where Israel was, and it forced the Philistines to the southern part. So if you can imagine this, there's a mountains and a field, and they're dug in on both sides. And so neither one of them would go into that valley because it would leave their army exposed and their troops exposed. And so they had to sit there and strategically figure out what was going on. Well, for weeks and weeks in the story of David and Goliath, how David emerges, those two armies sat across from that valley just staring at it. They're trying to strategically figure out uh, what to do. It was there where the Philistine, the Philistine army decided to send their mightiest warrior out and his name was Goliath and they were going to do what they called in ancient warfare a single combat um, so this si single combat thing was a way to settle disputes against warring nations and it was a, a way to prevent a full-scale war and all that bloodshed shed by sending out their very best warrior um, for a winner-takes-all duel well, it just so happened that the Philistines, they loved this because they had a guy named Goliath who was a legendary, and the Bible says, a mighty champion. And by the way, the story is in 1 Samuel 17. So Goliath, it says, was over nine feet tall, and he's covered in bronze armor that is like scaled like, like a dragon. It's said that the tip of his javelin weighed 160 pounds. So it was really well known that this was a mighty warrior. And Goliath stepped up and he would walk into that valley that no one would go into and he would issue or call out for a single combat brawl to the Israelites. Well, this frightened the men of Israel because his size, his very presence made them like literally run in fear. And so no one accepted that cha challenge. Now, while all that's going on, at the same time, we have Jesse, who is the father of David. And what we find out is that he had several sons, one of them being David, but his other sons were literally bogged down on the northern ridge waiting for the king to give orders about what to do. And um, so they're in the midst of all this stuff that's going on with Goliath and everything else. Well, Jesse, like all concerned fathers for his kids, for his boys, um, as these weeks drug out, he wondered if his boys would starve. So he decided to take um, David and or actually make David take them food to make sure they weren't uh, starving on that ridge while this war supposedly drug on. So. Uh, just as David uh, is called into this story, we see that his father sends him and he gets to the northern ridge where his brothers are. And just as he finds his brothers, all of a sudden, it must have been in the morning because the Philistine champion named Goliath steps into the valley and with a thunderous voice, he challenges and mocks Israel uh, to settle the score for once and for all. Well, David is completely enamored and shocked by this, and he's looking around at all these uh, soldiers, and they he finds that they're all just paralyzed in fear. 
each of them were scared and not one of them was stepping up. And this moved David to where something inside of him made him drop everything he was supposed to be doing with his brothers and for his father, Jesse. And he went and sought out the king. Well, as he was going to find the king, it was there that the king, King Saul, stood up and he was frustrated because no one would step up either. And so he was getting ready to announce that um, to all of his army, that whoever would step up and face Goliath, that they would have as much wealth as he could give them. And he would give them, give anybody who did this and defeated Goliath, his daughter's hand in marriage. So you imagine that for a, a pauper or somebody just uh, who wasn't in the king's court, this was a lifetime of opportunity and still no one stepped up. But it was then in sort of this weird timing, David emerged from the crowd and he literally says, I'll fight Goliath. Now imagine this little boy, he's like 13 or 14 years old. It's like Elijah or Kellen or somebody like that. It was at that moment when the attention of all those people that were listening to the king looks at this little boy, this kid, and hears that he'll step up and do it. And so in this loud, unified laughter, they began to mock David, but King Saul, not so much. At first, he tried to talk David out of it, but then he realized that none of his mightiest warriors were stepping up, so he took David seriously, so seriously that he gave him his armor, but David, who was still a boy, would not wear that armor because he didn't feel like he could fight with such a heavy armor on. So it's here, and this is where we're at. In this part of the story, I'd like to make a few um, points to you guys to encourage you over the next few weeks. First, as we look at David, David wasn't looking for glory. He was looking, he was looking at God. He wasn't looking at who we should fear. Something inside of him didn't sit right when the fear and intimidation tactics of the enemy challenged God's people. Now, David, even though he was a boy, he had a wisdom enough not to measure the enemy, but understand the size, the power, and the wisdom and the strength of God. You see, the weapons of the enemy uh, is to back us into a corner and paralyze us and intimidate, intimidate us and make us fearful. It, see, so if we focus on the enemy, if we focus on those voices, on those words, and the size of the challenge in front of us, what we do is we allow them to take ground in our hearts and in our minds, and that ground was really meant for God. You see, the enemy will always challenge us. It will always make us feel that we're not good enough, like we're not going to make it through this, like we won't have provision, like God is not big. It uses the weapons that are unseen. Now think about that. Depression, anxiety, shame, guilt to affect our heart, and therefore it affects our behavior, our relationships to our spouses, to our loved ones, and to our children. Now, all of those are all of those things, those unseen things, anxiety, shame, those kind of things, are the exact opposite of what Jesus has for us. And see, David knew who he was and what God had declared over his people. His stance wasn't based on on what was in front of him. It wasn't in, in uh, based on the voices that are coming at him from all different directions. No, it was on what God had declared over his people. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, David gave an inch to the tactics of the enemy. He wasn't just protecting the boundaries of Israel when he stepped up. He was protecting the boundaries of his own heart, which was filled with, with the motives and declarations and substances of God, like peace, like love, like joy, like righteousness, even if it was an angry righteousness. So in this time, I want to encourage you to know who you are and to allow God's word to fill your heart, your mind, and meditate on it. Did you know the Bible states in Philippians 4, 8 through 10, 10 whatever is good whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever, wherever there is excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. So we need to think about those things, right? Don't let 
The unseen voices of this world put us in fear. Secondly, if I can keep going here, because I think this is pretty good. One of the most overlooked part of this story is the part where we see Jesse, David's father, enter into this story and send David to his brothers on that mountain ridge. That is such a huge part of this story. My point here is we often overlook that because we don't see that God is always working. And although we don't always understand the affairs of God and how he moves, it seems clear to me that the story of David shows us that when there's crisis, when there's war, God is not absent. When there's things going on we don't understand, God is not absent. He's moving and he's working. You see, the Israelites, the army of the Israelites, they took their eyes off God. They didn't understand um, that the battle was already lost because their hope was not found in God alone. And they didn't know who God was and who, who he could do. I mean, what he could do. So we have to remember that that hope that we need is to put our faith in what God has done. The, the apostle John in the book of John puts it this way. He says, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so ask yourself this, when David sees what's going on and he sees that giant step out of the southern ridge into the valley of Elam to challenge Israel, what was David seeing? Who was David seeing? Is David, who was David seeing as a giant in this story? Was it Goliath or was it God? Well, I think David was just doing what he was told that day. He didn't realize that when he woke up, that God would do and give him a victory in his life and for all of God's people. So I want to encourage you that during this time, David, just like David, um, we need to uh, be aware that God is moving, even if it's subtly, even if we don't understand how. And he's using people like Jesse that don't even know they're being used and at the end of the day, God's victory and purposes comes forth. So we know that we can stay in faith and stay in hope. And the Bible tells us that those who hope in the Lord, um, the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles and will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So I want to encourage you to stay in hope Keep the word of God in you and allow it to form you by knowing who God is and what he can do. Uh, David did not wake up that day thinking he would become King David one day. It's God who establishes his purpose subtly through things we can't understand. Here's the last thing I want to get. Um, this has to do with King David and Saul. When David is allowed to uh, go to Goliath and defeat him. He's allowed to do that by King Saul. And remember, Saul gave him his armor, but David refused it. See, we need to understand is that David knew how to fight the enemy. The Bible says the enemy's not the flesh and blood, but it's the spirits and principalities. In other words, the real, the real battle we really are going to go through is unseen. Well, this is obvious when we look at the army of Israel in front of the Philistine army, they're acting in the flesh, but Goliath was winning because he had already intimidated them. He had paralyzed them with fear. He made them hide in anxiety. So they were unable to act. But when David showed up, that changed everything. You see, the Israelites, the army were dressed in the wrong armor. Their armor wasn't empowered by the things of God. It wasn't empowered by the hope and the strength and the courage of God. They chose fear over those things. They chose uh, uh, cowardice over those things. They weren't dressed in the things that God gives them that only obtainable through his victory and by faith. So what are some of those things that the enemy tries to attack us with? that we can learn from this story. The first thing is deception. Um, here's what we need to know. Like the army of Israel, just because they believed in God didn't mean they trusted him, right? 
They all thought they were God's children. But when you don't know God, then you don't know what he can do. And that is the first step to being deceived and putting your hope and faith somewhere else. And you start listening to the wrong voices. The second thing is, so don't be deceived. Put your hope in Jesus. The second thing is paralyzed. Lack of faith keeps us from action, from purpose. You know, the book of James tells us to be doers of the word and not just hear it. What good is believing in God if we're not able to live that out and experience the victory just like David did? When we get to experience God's goodness, doesn't that give us confidence to that, that no matter what comes before us, we don't look at the problem, we look at how big our God is. So be like Israel and become a victim by lack of faith. Trust and hope and put your faith in God. And when you feel like fear is coming on, grab your Bibles, grab the word and see what God says about it and trust. The third thing is cowardice. You guys, inaction is not purpose. And when we're paralyzed by things like fear and anxiety, um, that isn't God's purpose for us. You see, David lived with purpose because even on his worst day, even when he sinned, he still loved God and wanted to live for God. And so God was gracious towards David and God gave him victory after victory. It didn't mean David didn't feel consequences of things. It just meant that God never forsake him and God always got him through. Israel's weakness in this battle wasn't strategic it was faithlessness, which led to purposeless, purposelessness. That's a big word for me. Um, but listen, guys, distrust, distrust in God doesn't reveal God's victory. So I want to encourage you, don't go towards retreat. Don't hide in shame when these feelings come on. Stop, pray, read the word of God, and allow God to bring victory in those areas in your life. When we're purposelessness, when we have purposelessness, when we are paralyzed by things, it just leaves us where we are, and God doesn't want to do that. Did you know that the victory that we have in Jesus is there to get the, that unseen enemy, those voices that scream at us when we have those few moments alone? It, it tries to get us to dress in the wrong armor. Do you get what I'm saying? Did you know that the Bible talks about putting on the right armor? And that's what I want to leave you with today. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 11, 20, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on as shoes for your feet the readiness of the gospel, which is your peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which will distinguish and put out the flaming darts of the evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and declare it and pray it at all times in the spirit. You guys, the victory is there for us, even in times like this. Like David, we, as we read out the word of God, we know who he is and then who we are and what he can do. So remember, God gave us the belt of truth. That means we can trust Jesus, the breastplate of righteousness. That is his righteousness established on our behalf for him. It is news of the gospel, which is good news in times like this, when everything looks a little desperate. And he gave us the shield of faith to extinguish the voices of the news and social media and all this bad news that's coming at us. We have the shield of faith to look to God, to know that greater is he that is in us than these things that are in the world. And he gave us the helmet of salvation, which establishes our victory in his word, and we can live by the sword of his spirit. I want to encourage you during this time to reflect and read the word, encourage, I want to encourage you guys to not look at the size of the enemy, even though that we know this COVID virus is unseen. And I want to, I want to encourage you to be wise and take it seriously, but keep faith in Christ Jesus, who will get each of us through this. I want you to know that I love you and I'm praying for you. And God is going to get this victory 
for all of us here in America and across the world. I really believe that. Stay in faith, guys. God loves you. He loves your family. And he has great things on the other side of this. Hey, let's take some time and worship now. I love you. Lord, be with every one of these guys. Be with the people on the front of the line. As we come to worship and listen to song, I pray right now that you, O oh Lord, would just touch us with your spirit. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Hey, we're going to do some worship right now. I'll see you in a second. Been washed by the 